Hello there, Seraphim17 once again. This is my Splinter Cell Hard Difficulty video walkthrough. This is the final mission of the campaign. It is entitled the Georgian Presidential Palace. This is the finale. This is one of the trickiest missions on the game. It is also a longer one. And at the beginning here, it's going to be a little dark. Because this game's a little bit dark, but it's got some pretty interesting vistas that looked considerably more impressive at the time than they do now, but still an interesting hallmark of, of where we've come from, as I try to jump up on this post, and it's having none of it, but we get it in the end. So, if you've never built anything in a, in a 3D program, you're probably not too plussed about exactly how it happens. You might have one of those kind of logical brains that can figure it out and can kind of look and appreciate it and, and figure it out that way, but you might not. So if you look at this... Uh, what we're seeing right here, you see the background there? Quite apparent that it's not been modelled, I think we can all agree. It is essentially a plane that has a texture on it. And that really hasn't changed too much in, in modern games that are coming out and coming out in this next year. The only difference is we hide it a lot better thanks to higher resolutions and tricks that were, we've learnt just through reiterations of techniques. And... Uh, coming back to this game and looking at that vista, it still looks good, considering that when we played these games, we didn't really have high definition televisions, so our TVs were blurry, and that definitely helped, but when you look at it and you think what they've managed to do with it, you can see seams in some parts. But then you look at Destiny, which has some fantastic skyboxes. The skyboxes are one of the best parts of that game. But you wouldn't have, you know, those awesome skyboxes if, if Bungie had not cut the teeth with the Halo series. And, you know, before this, games used to hide that kind of feature with fog because they didn't really know how to figure it out. So instead of just, you know, putting a, f a texture that can look quite flat and quite blurry in the distance to give the illusion of, of depth perception, they just hid everything with obscurity. And speaking of obscurity, there was a rather rough transition just then. The reason is, I was on this little lip for quite some time, watching everybody's pattern. And instead of restarting so I could hide it a little better than that, I just trimmed it when I got back to the point where I'd climbed up. And this was the path that I, I spotted. So I'm going to be skirting around this first area, and I'm going to move into this garden maze. From here, we're going to be saving. There are a couple of things to be aware of as well. I have a dog on my tracks at this moment, and he's eventually going to find me. Regardless of where I go, he's going to find me. So, as soon as I saved when I got to that other side, I began walking back towards this side. I'm going to wait now in this corner, and I'm going to hit this dog with a ring airfoil round. Because if I don't, he's going to find me, and it's going to end the game. I've somehow managed to put no sugars in my coffee, so I'm going to be pulling some pretty interesting faces throughout this commentary. And if that comes across on the microphone in the way I'm speaking, I do apologise... Apparently I've uh, been making coffees my entire life and uh, I'm just not very good at them at this moment in time. <laughs> but Waiting on this dog can be a little annoying. Uh, it might not find you, but you can always tell when it does because the music starts playing and you get that little drum loop that it does. But there goes the dog. Hang on a second, I think I just shot that dog. Interesting. Uh, so yeah... If you like animals, that's probably not your favourite part of this walkthrough, but they're a pain in the ass, the dogs, and you've got to put them down. I could have used a ring airfoil round, but I just went for the kill. So, now that the dog's out of the way, we can do what I want to do here, which is go back towards this area. And my previous strategy, you had to be really quick to do it. And... Uh, not everybody can be very quick, and that's one of the things that I'm always trying to bear in mind when I'm doing walkthroughs. And it's why I always try and make a distinction between a walkthrough and, and kind of like a, a guilty pleasure project. Whereas, uh, when I impose restrictions on myself in, in these walkthroughs, I don't expect you to. You know, it's not part of the guide, it's just the, the way that it was recorded. And uh, whereas all the information that I give to you is generally based on the, the you know, the way I played it, which will feature said requ restrictions, requirements, so on and so forth. It's never enforced, it's never intended that way, unless it's a specific kind of function walkthrough. Uh, you get this, the code for this door off one of the data sticks, off one of the guys, I believe. Uh, not that you need it, because if you watch this walkthrough, you'll have the number. 
Uh, I'm kind of sat here and not touching the machine because I don't want it to make the beep just in case he hears it but apparently that doesn't make a difference he didn't hear it and I can as soon as he turns away move towards this corner but when you're doing those kind of pleasure projects you can do the the really really good gameplay stuff because it's not about somebody emulating what you're doing and don't get me wrong people can learn a lot from that masterful showcases of awesomeness but to the average guy who doesn't have you know a spare 10 hours to learn very precise timing there's no real point in showing them a strategy that can only be done once you have that kind of mastery. So I'm always looking for the, the lowest common denominator and I think that term can have a negative connotation and I never want it to have a, a negative connotation because it's, it's essentially how the world works and it's one of those lessons that can be very difficult to swallow if you you know, have ambitions and you strive for greater things but we're not going to talk about that, it's Christmas, we're going to keep this festive. <laughs> So, when this door opens, this door only opens when you go towards that other one. This is a, a triggered sequence where these guys come into this room. But if you're cheeky like I am, I'm going to stand very close to them and I'm going to exploit the fact that once they fan out, before, if you move quickly, they'll never get into a formation where they're moving around the room and they're becoming a problem. So you can just kind of skirt around this wall, coming up, and hit this door and completely circumvent this room. Because this room looks incredibly intimidating. And it is. However, once you have a path, it's very simple. You need to be really careful on these stairs, though, because some very cheeky lasers that'll catch you out if you're not careful. And because Sam is, is not the most eager person to climb things, it can be really difficult to get around them. So I'm going to do some expert-level jumping here, guys. Watch this for just pro skill. This is as skillful as it gets. So, there you go. That's one of those jumps that can go wrong in so many ways. And I know this because I have probably three or four attempts at that jump where Sam jumped the other way and I ended up in the lasers. <laughs> so be, if you're having trouble with any of the wall jumping on this game, you're not alone. It's the way it was programmed. It isn't as good as it needed to be. But it does work. It's just finicky. And now that we're upstairs, the, this is where it really begins. So as Sam just pointed out, there are some elite guards in this area. And elite guards are generally very armoured, which is a detriment to any kind of gunfight if you're going to have them. For the most, gunfights are not the way to play these games. The later Splinter Cells you can play with gunfights if you want to. These ones, incredibly difficult to do so. Not undoable, just incredibly difficult. The enemies have it stacked so much in their favour it's not even funny. But I shoot that light out there. He comes and has a look. Guy reminds me of the one of the generals off of Goldeneye who was in the bunker messing about with Boris's pen but just wait for him to, to do his thing and what we're doing here is we're waiting for these two guys these two guys walk in tandem and we do not want anything to do with that ground floor we don't need it what we do want is this guy and he believe it or not is investigating I think the shot that we just did so what I'm gonna do is now he's over here I shoot the wall You'll notice he's coming, his buddy's not even looking. This is a complete shadow, now we can get him. I don't run the risk of grabbing him just in case he spins and shoots me. I knock him out with a quick clop. His buddy looks like he knows what's going on, but I don't think he does. And because we are in shadow, we don't have to worry about anybody tripping up over this guy's body. I'm going to take his satchel just in case there's anything good in it. And then I'm going to wait for him to turn away. However... Interesting. What was that? So I pulled my gun and something happened. Ooh, he's curious. That's what it was. He must have seen the movement. You know, it is on the hardest difficulty. The AI is really highly tweaked, so I'm moving. Move as quickly as you can so that you can get in cover as he comes down these stairs. And what he's going to do is he's going to walk completely past us and we can elbow him in the back. And that'll be both the guards who are causing a problem for us in this room taken out effortlessly. I have no idea what just happened. How bizarre was that? The music was still playing, but the game just kind of locked up. And that's one of those things where I could trim that out effortlessly, but I've kept it in for a good reason, because that's the kind of jank that, that happens in games, and you wonder what the hell's going on. 
and sometimes when that happens in my videos it might be somewhere where I've trimmed out a, a going into a menu or trimmed out a save point or, or trimmed something out completely like gameplay wise but that right there folks that was not editing at all that was the game and I don't have to tell you if you played these that this this high definition trilogy has issues and I would go as far as to say the first major problem with this high definition release is that it's a PlayStation exclusive because it doesn't make any sense this franchise was created at the beginning to be a, a direct competitor to Metal Gear Solid which was the franchise of course that was one of the flagships for Sony so this was a Microsoft property that then went on to other consoles and I'm really happy that it did because it gives a, cha a game the biggest chance to succeed and I think that's what a lot of fanboys kind of forget as much as you know, you, you like being loyal to consoles, you like slagging off other consoles, all you're really doing is console tribalism. You know, you're doing the same thing that villagers did to each other when somebody wanted some fucking sugar canes or some land and the other people didn't have enough cloth, so they were like, let's kill them all. But you're just doing it online on a keyboard and it's a little bit more pedantic, but... Exclusivity can be a great thing because it can force your competitor to have something to match it, but at the same time, it can also be a suffering point. For anybody wondering, that is a camera you can hear. This corridor here is very intimidating. A lot of cameras, a lot of people type, you know, they look worse than they are. It's, it's one of those areas that if you're incredibly, you know, well versed with what you're doing, you'll find a tricky path through it, like I'm doing right now. The shadows are literally your best friends. And uh, where I'm going now is where we need to go at the end of this video. So up here, this door is going to say that it's jammed. Whenever a door says this, it means it's going to open when you do something specific in the game world. So at the end of this video, we need to come back here, and we're going to be on this corridor. So for anybody who's confused or who's having issue, um, the next video is going to have us coming back here to, to this doorway. But with exclusivity, of course a game will suffer if it's only on one console, because you're cutting out the rest of the market an opportunity to even touch it. And that is always a bit of a sad thing, but these games are awesome, you know, the, they're a testament to the time and they inspired a lot of great progression in, in like the stealth genre and in kind of the espionage, Tom Clancy-esque spy stuff. And they've gone on to, to be refined and, and be really, really good. But you've always got to remember where things came from, you know, it's, I have very little respect for people who forget their history because I think you know you learn a lot from from looking back and it helps you move forward but I suppose it's one of those things where it's very easy to be to be ignorant of, of those who came before you because you you don't have any real contact with them and you don't have any real awareness of, of their struggle and things but this collection would be great on the other consoles but I doubt it'll ever happen and I think that's a massive shame a, a truly massive shame but this version does have issues, it has performance issues, it has save bugs, it has a lot of problems and it's kind of ironic now uh, when you think about Ubisoft at this moment in time because a lot of the goodwill that they've had they've squandered and I think a lot of people are, 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 are realising this, especially now that they're already talking about the next fucking Assassin's Creed like we don't need a rest from this pile of shit franchise you're building. Like, oh, it's going to be in England, it's going to be during this, it's going to be... They could set it on the Death Star before Luke's run, and I still wouldn't give a single shit, because they've just... It's just too much at this point, you know? Unless they really mix it up, and I think Black Flag did a great deal of mixing up. But even so, you know, they've got this, this cycle of games where they'll mix it up once every four years and it's it's just not good enough and unfortunately the the call of duty mentality is breeding more of this mentality so much so that other companies are being affected by it because they're looking at their bottom lines and there's a big discrepancy between theirs and these and their competitors so they're asking themselves and the financial advisors or they're just their analysts you know what are they doing different that way aren't and it's well they have these franchises they pump out every 12 months using the same engine and they tweak a few things and everybody buys them so very sad perspective but undoubtedly true because games are there to be made money from which is why I'm always grateful when I come up against something that you know you're not really expecting to, to be much of a big deal and I'm always excited about new IPs because we don't have enough of those and I think that's the reason why the, the consoles at the moment are suffering because they don't have those killer apps that 
that build consoles. They don't have the Gears of Wars. They don't have the God of Wars. They don't have their Uncharted, you know, their the Halos yet. They have a lot of smaller ones and, and less ambitious ones and some pretty solid third-party stuff, but it's not enough. And that changes for the PlayStation 4 when Bloodborne drops. I couldn't tell you when it changes for the Xbox One because I'm not entirely sure. And that's pretty sad. I mean, at this moment in time, the Wii U is definitely putting itself out there because it's got some really good titles on it now. And it's probably the only console that's still online thanks to the whole hacking situation that's that's happening. Which a few people have wondered my opinion of this. Uh, I have very little sympathy for the companies that are being affected. I have massive sympathy for the consumer. At the end of the day, these people, regardless of their motives, are denying a service. They're denying a service that people pay for and thus they're committing a crime. It's a very big crime when you add up all the people who are being denied service, so... It's something that has to be stopped, but unfortunately I am rather illiterate when it comes to hacking and DDoSing and, and whatever's happened to, to be able to do what they've done. So I don't know what you can put in the way of security against this, but what I do know, folks, is both Microsoft and Sony have more fucking money than sense, and they need to put some of that money into making sure that this service they're giving us, that we're paying for, actually works. Because regardless of these asshole, you know, cyber terrorists... It all starts from, from the people that are giving us this service, and if we don't get some kind of reparations for this, this lapse, I think that's absolutely disgusting. But once again, I'm ignorant of, of a lot of the details and the minutiae that probably explains exactly what's going on. But thank you very much for watching. I will see you in the finale of Splinter Cell. You take care now.